you can mm -hmm. see um, people are walking in the door. And so I am going to take this as a moment to say hello and welcome to everyone. We are so delighted to have you with us at today's podcast about leading data communities with the directors of ICPSR and SESTA. We will hear more about that in just a moment. But first, I wanted to let you know that this podcast is being recorded. And during these live presentations, some of us are in a hybrid situation where we're either at home or in the office or wherever we are. Just please excuse cameos from our canine colleagues or other, other unexpected moments. We hope this doesn't happen, but if this podcast were to close unexpectedly, please reopen it from the link you used to attend this presentation. We welcome your questions. Please type in questions at any time using the Q&A box on the bottom of your Zoom window. A live transcript is available. To show or hide that transcript, click the up arrow on the live transcript button. Please note for those viewing on a phone or tablet, the Zoom app currently highlights only the active speaker. The live transcript will still be available, but you may need to scroll to the left or right to see the presenter or the presentation. Actually, we don't have that today, so <laughs> you can just keep looking at us or uh, going to the speaker. For privacy, all participants are in listen-only mode with microphones muted and chat between participants is unavailable. One last note, if you're posting to social media about what you learn here, please use hashtag ICPSR and hashtag SESTA, also hashtag data brunch. And once again, this podcast will be recorded. And now I wanna give a warm welcome to all of our participants around the world and our guest, SESDA Director Ron Decker and ICPSR Director Maggie Levenstein. Today's talk will be moderated by yours truly, ICPSR's Dory Knight Ingram and SESDA's Eleanor Smith. Also, a special shout out to ICPSR's Anna Shelton and SESDA's Catherine Slata, who are tweet live tweeting today's event on behalf of ICPSR and SESDA and Data Brunch podcast producer, Scott Campbell. Okay, with that, I will hand things over to you, Eleanor. Thank you, thank you, Dory. So welcome, welcome to everyone and welcome Ron and Maggie. So we're very excited to bring everyone together today and especially to hear from two of the world's biggest data consortia as we come to the end of 2021. So today we hope to touch on topics such as navigating the pandemic to the future of research data. And our first question is for both of you. So what is it like to lead the ICPSR community? Maggie and for Ron, what is it like to lead the SESTA community? So I forget which of you said you wanted to go first, but I, I'm Maggie. happy to kind of uh, launch in. I mean, I think that, um, I think that I have to say for me, it, it's been, it is, it's actually really inspiring to, to lead the ICPSR um, community, um, both because of the, the commitment of the, the staff and the, and the faculty here at ICPSR, and most importantly from all of the people who are, are members of the consortium and who are um, users of our data around the world, it's really, um, it's really, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's very inspiring just to see people's willingness to share data and to talk to each other about data and to make their data available and, and their appreciation for how important it is that we have high quality accessible data to help us understand um, the world in which we live and to make better decisions and just, you know, give us insights into social behavior, or social change. Um, and to see that people really value having data and making it accessible to others. And we, we care about that here at ICPSR, but we see that every day from our users, both those who share data and people who use data um, at institutions, um, researchers, community members around the world. So that's, yeah. Thank you, Maggie. 
And for you, Ron, what is it like to lead the SESTA community? Um, besides inspiring, I would say exciting. It, it is a multi-dimensional world where you have the whole community, researchers, data producers, data users, um, research funders, uh, governments. Um, so it's it's a mix of, of different people, of different expertise. Um, and I forget the, 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 the data experts, uh, both at universities and at, uh, at the data service providers. Um, so it's, it's a mix of, of various activities. Um, and it's, uh, it's like playing chess on, on different tables at the same time sometimes. So it can, it, yes, it can be busy. Um, for, for me, it's also revealing. Um, I think we, sometimes we are in a kind of bubble where we think that data archiving is, the, is normal and we have all the facilities. But every now and then I run into to contacts with research communities who, who don't have an archive, who don't know how to set up an archive. And that varies up to communities that want to use artificial intelligence in, in, their, in their data. So it's, it's a broad spectrum, which makes it exciting. And yeah, sometimes, um, I question the, 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 the lack of rewarding. We, we always have to explain why it is important to have a data infrastructure like the social science data archives. I think once you wouldn't have the facility, then you would, within a day, you would see what, what you're missing. If take, take climate data, take COVID data, uh, uh, attitudes, uh, uh, election data, if, if we wouldn't have our data archives where the history of opinions of, of facts would would disappear and that's that's difficult to show where what your value added is it's, it's more what are you missing once we are not there an important aspect as well would we be missed? And yes. Yes. So, so, oh, so I don't think there's any question at all that we would be missed. Some people may or may not appreciate that. But I think that the examples that Ron brought up um, are, you know, of climate change, of COVID. Um, th those are things which people might think of that there's sort of a, 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 a uh, a hard science question. There's a, bio a biology question. There's a right. There's you know it's atmospheric science. But we know in 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 each of these cases that these are that we are not going to find solutions. We're not going to understand the problem, and we're not going to be able to solve the problem without understanding human behavior and social institutions, and 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 understanding how people actually interact and behave and respond, not just based on sort of my idea about how I respond and sort of in assuming the rest of the world, you know, that every, you know, it thinks and behaves as I do. We need to understand people who are different from us. I mean, you need to understand um, social organizations, um, which are not just me as an individual, but how we each interact and, and how our, how, how we, how our interactions affect others. And we can only do that by having um, behavior about large numbers of groups of people and, and social institutions. And that's what the social science data archives allow us to do. Um, and, and I don't, there's no question in my mind that we are in a period where the importance of these questions is has never been clearer. We we cannot solve the critical issues of our day without social science and without the data that allows social science to um, to be grounded in the ways that 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 people really do behave and interact in the social institutions in which we live. Yeah. And I think social sciences, uh, sorry for the physics, but social sciences is much more exciting. <laughs> uh, to, to, to some extent, the, the, these particles are pretty consistent. If you put a charge here, they go that way. Uh, and next time they, they go the same way, uh, unless you change the charge. And, uh, but, but for people, if you ask opinions, then people can learn from, from the results of, uh, of social science. So they, they, they might, next time they might behave differently. And, yeah, I know what the physicist uh, will say. Uh, if you go to quantum physics, uh, then it will change, of course. But 
for for me, social science is, is uh, yeah, it's uh, much more fun. So talking of fun, the next question for you, Maggie, is what is your happiest ICPSR memory? Oh, my happiest ICPSR memory. Um, I suppose um, uh, I was the thing that comes to mind first was when we won the 2019 um, national medal for a museum and library service. And when, um, and I have to say it was a complete surprise, but the happiest memory of it was when we had a party of all of the ICPSR staff to celebrate it because it really, um, you know, working in a data archive is not the kind of thing that people often get a lot of public acclaim for. And it is the kind of thing that it's hard to explain to your parents, what is it that you do, right? And to your friends. And so to have that kind of national recognition and to be able to come together and celebrate it was, was, was a pretty happy moment. Thank you. And what about you, Ron? What was your happiest moment, happiest memory at Santa? Yeah. Oh, I thought that my happiest uh, moment at ICP is our, that, uh, because I, I know that one. Uh, <laughs> that, that was when, when one of the former directors, it, it was Hal Winsboro, it invited me and two other people to, to do a check on, on the new processing at ICPSR. And we were flown in for 48 hours. So I, I, I made the, the, the flight across the ocean. He made the views of uh, the time uh, lag so we, we could immediately start. And I think we, we went on for, for 24 hours and then uh, flew out again. And I still remember this big cellar, uh, this big room on the left-hand side, the old processes on the other side, the, the, the new processes that we had to figure out in, in one day what they had written down in the reports and we had interviews and that that was really, it was hard work, but it was also really fun. And uh, I, I hope it was to the benefit of ICPSR. So that's my ICPSR memory. Um, my SESDA memory, the, yeah. Thank you for sharing those memories. So no. Yeah, um, no. Oh, Can okay. I just say I so just um, based on when um, Hal was the the leader of I, the director of ICPSR, I think that that was part of the process in which we you know we used to at ICPSR ship tapes to all of our users um, if somebody wanted if somebody wanted ICPSR data, they would go to their um, local um, official representative and they would reach out to ICPSR and we would ship them tapes. And um, during the period um, when um, Hal was the director, we shifted over to first FTP and then web-based um, dissemination of data so that now about 90% of our data individual um, users can directly download and use locally. And that required a real change in how we process and disseminated data. About 10% of our data is still restricted for confidentiality purposes, so you can't download it like that. But most of our data can. And, and again, those kinds of technological changes that ICPSR and other data archives around the world, we sort of take for granted now. We can get data instantaneously, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of investment in infrastructure and in people from different archives sharing knowledge as you did, um, Ron, to, to, to make those processes um, work well, to make that technology work for the research community. So thank you yeah. for coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So still, still remember, and I also, but that was at the at the Dutch Data Archive, the, the Steinmetz Archive. I remember when the researcher just came with a shoebox of floppy disks and saying, "Here are my data, but please, please archive them." So that, yeah, that 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 was funny. Um, for for Cesda, um uh, I, I, I want to mention the, the official start as uh, as a European research infrastructure where we had the director general of the European Commission on, on research over in, in Bergen and we had a formal start. Um, but also uh, setting up the, the main office team, we have uh, 10 wonderful people uh, in, in, in the Bergen office we managed to do in cooperation with the, with the members, uh, 
to set up a data catalog. And that 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 was a lot of work. It, it felt like one step forward and then two too backward because you had to do the, the, the vocabulary, you had to do this and check on the metadata standards, which, which turned out to have different interpretations in each of the uh, archives. And But in the end, we, we managed. And if I see that we, we it took us several years to build this, uh, this uh, base platform, but now that we have it, it yeah, uh, it's, it's very nice to, to see what we have accomplished in um, at least in the five, five years that we are uh, official European research infrastructure now. Well, this was a yeah. perfect, perfect transition. Thanks for taking us down memory lane about tapes and uh, the way that data used to be collected. Can you talk about how data are collected now in Europe, in the USA, and how do you see that changing? Yeah, I can I, I can kick off this this time perhaps. Um, it's changing in the sense that um, then then you need to know that SESTA is a distributive uh, research infrastructure. So we have a small main office in in Bergen in Norway, but the, the the primary work is done by data archives, data service providers in 23 countries, and each of the country has at least one national data service provider. So they do the intake of, of the data. And um, yes, it's, it's by, by submitting or uploading data, but also a, a kind of self-service where people can submit the data, provide the metadata, and it, it, it's almost an automatic process. So that, that's one. Another trend I see is that um, we have quite some big European surveys, which also start like uh, like a platform where you can can join uh, we have the european social survey the european value studies ifsp is of course known uh, share which is on health and retirement and you see these european surveys coming up uh, so i would say a, a large and an increasing professionalization of how you deal with data um, and, and that takes place in, in different countries, but also over the countries like the social the European social survey. So it's, it's increasing and it's uh, getting more professional. And yes, we, we offer the, the, the self-service to the, to the researchers. And I think that changes the role of, of, of the data curators at the, at, at the data services. But perhaps Maggie, you you know much more about this. Mm. So I would say, I mean, I think like um, like SESTA, we get data from many different sources, sometimes from individual researchers. And we have a, a similar kind of thing which called open ICPSR, which is really designed for individual um, researchers to share their data um, immediately. This is usually data that's um, associated with a, a, a journal publication or something like that. Um, we also have data collections that are from large um, longitudinal studies, you know, similar to share things like Midas, the um, uh, and uh, the midlife, uh, midlife. I what the D is for data in the United States. Midlife, I forget. Anyway, and, um, is one uh, that's that is a similar study of aging, like share. We um, uh, monitoring the future. These are large, professionally collected survey data. Um, some of it is cross-section, some of it's longitudinal. Um, we also have um, other sort of large-scale um, surveys that, that come to us. Increasingly, I think, in terms of the changes, so we, so we get those from both individuals and from organizations that are collecting data and they share their data through ICPSR. In terms of the future of data collection, I would say increasingly we are getting data that is um, not surveys or not just surveys. So we're getting data sets that include social media. It might be social media and surveys, or it might just be social media. Um, data that comes from streaming devices, things that include video. Um, geospatial data is obviously something which is which people are doing new and creative things with. 
Um, there's much we um, there are a large number of data sets that I would call sort of non design or found data where someone has scraped data from a website that has, um, you know, that's tax data from a, you know, that's made available by localities or um, or data from other kinds of administrative sources that's on a publicly available website and a researcher scrapes that and assembles it into a, um, a research data, which they then use and share with the broader community. So I think we're seeing um, a lot more what I would call non-design data. So not a survey that's been designed for research purposes, but researchers using data that has been um, the digital content that's been created in some other context, whether it's social media or an administrative function or, um, or you know, their, the, the Fitbits that people are wearing on their wrists, those kinds of things. And researchers take those non-design data and, and manipulate them to create a research data set, which then is shared with others. Um, and so that has, that actually does create challenges for how we um, document and make sure that there's provenance that's clear. People understand where those data came from and what the population is that they represent because they're not designed to sample a, a particular population. So in terms of sharing those data with the research community, there's a there are differences in the standards and the technology that. Um, goes with the data, but there are also um, differences in what people need to understand as they use um, these new kinds of data. And I think there's enormous potential. We're really excited by those new kinds of data collection, but I think for all the social science data archives are sort of are working to improve the standards and the information so that people are, are making good use of those data um, as, they, as they start to work with them. Thank you. So also, no. also, if Dori, if I may, may mm -hmm, add sure. uh, a trend I see in, in, in Europe is that the official st statistics offices are opening up. Um, even Eurostat, that collects all the data from the national statistics offices, is is now developing uh, not only a policy but also tools to to may provide access to their data uh, for researchers, and um, that has to do. Uh, I think don't think it's it's downloading. It's more lo logging into to their computer, uh, which is another trend uh, that I see, um, because the data are getting bigger and bigger, um, and I see um, the the complexity of the data is increasing. We, we also have these mixed mode data. Uh, I, I remember from Gesis where they suddenly they they had a twin study and suddenly they they had also had the DNA and the blood samples. And then, then you have to set up a new policy, how to deal with this type of, of data. So it's, yeah, it's, it's getting more, it's getting faster, bigger and more complex. So that's why it's exciting to be at SESTA and ICPSR, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about the future data. I'm sitting here looking at my uh, <laughs> Apple Watch and, and just it, wondering. It's, <laughs> yep, it's collecting all kinds of data ab about you and, and millions of other people right now. Mm -hmm. Data live. All right. Yeah. So this is a good chance to stop and ask a question to our, our participants. And uh, we actually have a couple of questions coming in Q&A. The question I want to ask is, uh, have you ever used ICPSR? or says the data before. So let's go ahead and see. All right, you can see answers coming in. Oh, it says can't. panelists can't vote. <laughs> Objection. <laughs> Should have put a, uh, an answer in there that said both. Give out special prizes for that. But yeah. right now the uh, options are yes, no, or I don't know. Well, that, I don't know. That that, that uh, might also refer to CESA because we are a consortium of national data service providers, and and many researchers go directly to the national service provider. So, uh, Dons in the Netherlands, or uh, Gase is in Germany, UK Data Service in the, in the UK, and and they are not even aware that it's also uh, a, a, a central European catalog where they can find the data. 
Yeah, I think that's probably true for some ICPSR collections as well, not because we have different national uh, collections, but we have different archives. So we have a we have a criminal justice archive and we have a, an aging data archive and a demographic data archive and um, uh, one that works on studies on drug abuse. So and, and those and those are very much. Um, you know, they're 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 tailored to those research communities. Um, and if you look, you can see that those are ICPSR data that, that those are actually hosted by ICPSR, use ICPSR technology, and you could easily go from theirs to um, to the broader um, confederated catalog of ICPSR data, but you could easily not know that. Um, yeah, and actually, guess one one thing that I think you've done at SESTA um, for the Europe for the European data catalogs, and that we really I would love to see us do more broadly, is to allow people to search to start searching at SESTA and see what's in the European catalogs, yeah. and then see what's beyond that to come to ICPSR mm -hmm. and start seeing here, and then realize that oh, there's data just like interlibrary loan for those of you who. Remember what that is, being able to search more broadly and find data um, through interlocking catalogs. So I think mm -hmm. that that's a goal for the future. Yeah, you, you, you're touching on two important points, I think. One is the quality and the provenance of data. Um, the discussion we have in, in CESA is whether we should include uh, data uh, uh, descriptions that are not from one of our members, but then we run into a quality issue because the mm -hmm. members are, are required to have a core trust seal to meet quality standards, to do this questioning on the provenance and the quality of data. And I think that that's an important issue that, uh, that, that yep. where you can say, okay, the, these data have been checked by ICPSR or, mm -hmm. and, the other one is on on the on the data catalog, um, um, where you uh, in, in in Europe we are working on a European initiative to combine data over over domains. So with the life sciences, with the environment sciences, etc. One of the ideas of the catalog is to do just like Amazon. If if you search for uh, health or uh, health and retirement data. In, in the SESTA catalog that you also get a hint that this is in in another data set that is in uh, in life sciences or in, in, in your example, Maggie, that, that there is a data set also in ICPs are on this topic. Mm -hmm. But that needs a lot of tagging in the, in the back office uh, to, mm. to make the data well, findable. Yep, and th that actually reminds me of the thing you were talking when you were talking about integrating data from the different um, archives across Europe and how even though in principle they were using the same metadata standards in practice they were interpreted um, they it, they're used in different ways and it's very funny because you know I've said to people it's not a standard if everybody has their own right and I think but um but it's very but it is it is hard actually well as as people in Europe know is um, better than perhaps than anybody, harmonization is an ongoing chat is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing challenge. And um uh and 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 I think it is one of those things where there are just enormous benefits to um using um harmonized um, metadata standards in terms of making data fair, making it interoperable, helping people to find um, data and to understand what's comparable in data, but it but it takes it takes a lot of work on the part of the um, data archives around the world to um, to to create that um, that interoperability and to harmonize um, things because even when we we do adhere to the same standards, um, they they get interpreted um, in somewhat different ways and certainly over time it's very easy to have divergence. Thank you. So I just typed into the chat the results of our poll. Thanks to everyone who voted. You'll be happy to know 82% of our participants have used ICPSR or assess the data. 18% said no, and no one said I don't know. All right. So Eleanor, you want to take a few from the Q&A? Thank you, Dori. Yes, we have a question in the Q&A for, uh, for both of you. How do the growth rates in deposits and downloads compare between ICPSR and SESDA? And are there any emerging new user communities? So I think we could start, uh, start with, uh, with you, Ron. 
Yes, thank you. Very good question. Not because of the surname of this uh, question uh, person, but uh, um, on, to, to be frank, on the on the growth rates, it, uh, I don't know, and it, it's also difficult to 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 interpret uh, because when we set up the catalog, we were taking an, in a lot of a lot of legacy. So we started with twenty thousand. Now we are on thirty three thousand uh, studies that are in the catalog, but that is to main part. Also, because the, the the connection with the a national data archive suddenly work, and plus, then you have plus six hundred studies. So that that that's a tricky one. Um, I like the one on the use of communities because that's uh, also in our strategy at the moment. Um, just to give you a brief overview, in the past five years, we focused on, on setting up the core tools like uh, a Thesaurus, the catalog, uh, data management expert guide for training, et cetera. And now we are in, in a phase uh, where we can um, reach out to communities. We, uh, we do that sometimes in CESDA projects, but also in European uh, Commission funded uh, projects. And what we saw in, in one of our biggest projects is that these communities are knocking on the door of, of SESTA. And um, they want to join, they want to have expertise from us. Uh, and joining is a little bit difficult because SESTA is organized as a, a membership of countries. So formally it's the countries who are the member and each country has to appoint a national data archive. So in Germany, it's the German ministry who is the member, but it's Giesis who is the data service provider. Um, and that makes it difficult for research communities to, to join something which is a, a membership organization. We are looking into this at this moment, as we speak, to see how we can um, set up um, uh, MOUs or agreements with these research communities, because I think, um, I think researchers are not per se interested in, in searching in a catalog of 30 or 40 or 50,000. They, they want to search in, in thematic and dedicated catalogs uh, on their topic. And this is something that we can now start thinking of now that we have the, the infrastructure for our uh, central data catalog. But I think reaching out to the communities, and as I said at the beginning, some just want to have an archive. Some want to know how they set up uh, a controlled vocabulary or some, some metadata standards to, to use on their local thing, uh, local database. And um, I think this is getting more and more important. So we are looking for um, not governance structures, but, but for, for ways to connect to these use of communities. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be my first reply. Thank you, Ron. Uh, how about you, Maggie? Would you like to also provide an answer to the question? Sure. From Harrison Becker? Yeah, so I, so I have no idea um, how to, you know, what the comparison is between ICPSR and SESTA in terms of the rate of growth of, of deposits or downloads, because I, I don't have that information about SESTA at all. Um, in terms of um, in terms of deposits, I think Ron is exactly right. It's very it would be very challenging to figure out. I mean, we could. We could I was I was just like we have now. ICPSR has of over sixteen thousand studies. We had ten thousand studies five years ago, so that suggests you know we've grown sixty percent over the last five years, which we've been around for sixty years. So that suggests a really increase, a big increase in growth rates, but that's as though you're counting each study as one thing. And of course they're not, right? There are some studies that are, you know, law, very large, um, uh, complex longitudinal studies. And there are other things that are one little data set that somebody cr um, created. Um, we also, um, as we've gotten data sets, I think we have, I don't know, hundred or so data sets in a COVID repository that came in the last year that, that those, those deposit, we created this repository about a year ago when people have deposited those things there. Um, I think we have 2000 data sets that, that are associated with a single set group of journals with from the American Economics Association. And they all got, as Ron said, those all just kind of got transferred to us at once. So, um, so that it's hard to, it's hard to have a meaningful 
calculation of the rate of growth of data. I don't think that there's any question that we are getting more data on a regular basis and that research has become more data driven and more empirical and that people are looking for data more. Um, and uh, so, so I would say, I would presume that both of us are, are growing and growing um, more quickly as data becomes more important um, to the social sciences and to research over time. In terms of new user communities, it was interesting how Ron thought about this. So our, our membership structure is different. Our members are um, mostly colleges and universities, also research institutions and statistical agencies around the world. Um, most of the research universities in the United States already belong to ICPSR, and our growth is to some extent um, in terms of international universities. It's also in terms of statistical agencies um, and, uh, and in terms of um, institutions where they have recognized um, that their students as well as their faculty really need access to high quality data. And so they're focused more on instruction, perhaps they're institutions that are focused more on instruction than on research. So those are areas in terms of our membership growth. And our, our we have about 800 members now worldwide, which is, again, has, has grown um, substantially over the last five years. When I, when I first at, look at the question about new user communities, I thought about it a little bit differently. Traditionally, our users, our primary users were social science faculty in, um, in colleges and universities, um, graduate students who are you know, getting their PhDs or perhaps their master's degrees at colleges and universities. Um, increasingly, we've seen um, that there's a good chunk of users that who are undergraduates and um, so that 18 to 21, 22 years old um, range who are getting bachelor's degrees and their instruction um, as part of their undergraduate degree, they, their instruction requires that they get their hands dirty and they actually get their hands on um, on data and they play with it themselves and they present it and analyze it themselves. And I think that that kind of data-driven education is incredibly important, even if people aren't going to become social scientists, even if they're not gonna become researchers themselves, to be um, an informed citizen of the world in the 21st century, being comfortable with um, analyzing data, understanding how to look at data is very, very important. So we see more students in that way. The other use, and I think that it's the flip side of that, the student use is use by um, policymakers and, 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 and communities who want to understand themselves. So for example, um, we have a new um, partnership with um, a group of, uh, with an organization in Flint, Michigan. And I don't know how many people in, uh, in Europe will know about Flint, Michigan, but it is a, it's a city um, in, uh, in Michigan that is about an hour and a half north of Detroit and was the, the world, was the, was a home of large um, General Motors um, uh, manufacturing, um, was the original birthplace of Fisher Body, one of the original parts of General Motors. And they, a few years ago, had lead identified in their water supply and, and had to stop using the municipal water supply for, um, for an extended period of time. And a large number of children um, suffered from lead poisoning. They've been collecting data um, about children who are ex were exposed to lead and the services that they've been receiving. We're making that data available for researchers who want to understand how to um, how to respond and how to improve our, the our water quality and, and, and services when people are, when children are exposed to lead um, in the future. But we don't wanna just make it available to research and experts. We also want there to be data that's available to the community. One of the things, actually we were talking about this um, before the, the webinar started, I think one of the real challenges at, and that if for data providers and data users is has been this, um, a decline in trust and trust in institutions. And I think data transparency and access to data can really help um, communities um, increase their trust in, um, in their governments and the information they're hearing from, um, from news organizations of the, um, and they really improve their ability to participate in, um, in, their, in decision-making in their communities. So uh, we are, uh, uh, we're really interested in building um, 
making data available to those kind of com to communities that are not professional researchers, making data accessible and giving people the tools to, to work with data so that they understand their own communities and are empowered to uh, participate in decisions about them. Thank you, thank you. So we have, uh, I'm gonna ask a question and then we'll circle back to the Q&A. How has the pandemic affected your data communities? I know where to start. Yeah. So Ron, I don't know if you want to talk about that first. And Ron looks frozen to me. I can't tell um, if it's me or them, um, but I'm going to go ahead and start talking because both Ron and Eleanor are frozen up at different times for me. So uh, I, I would say, I mean, in some ways on a day to day basis, the biggest impact has, of course, been, you know, on on for us on um, the people who work here at ICPSR, you know, sort of one day we were all in the office, you know, talking to each other and the next day we were all home and talking to each other only over computers for, you know, well over a year. Um, and so we, we have as a as a community, um, we've all sort of experienced that the the sort of the isolation, the 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 trauma, the fear. I think that all of us have lived through during the pandemic. So that's I would say that's the most immediate thing. Of course, that's also the case for um, for our our user community as well for our members. One of the things I was really proud of, um, uh, and I for. Um, of the staff at ICPSR, and I think Dory was involved in this, um, when we did sort of on a dime have to um, become remote, we immediately, um, we weren't just going remote, all of, you know, universities and instruction, colleges and universities all across the country and the world were going remote and people were trying to shift their instruction um, online. And um, the, the team, Dory and, and other members of her team produced a whole set of resources to help instructors make that transition so that they could get and to make sure that they could get access to data, even if they were, you know, from at home rather than at their university location, that they could get access to data for instructional purposes. And we sort of made a whole bunch of new things for people to use um, uh, for remote teaching. So that was um, that was a big change. ICPSR also has a very big um, summer program in which we have about a thousand people every summer usually come to Ann Arbor to study statistics and, um, and data analysis and data curation. And again, the summer program staff had to, on a dime, transition that to being a fully remote program. The last two summers, um, it was a fully remote program that I think was um, we met was was very successful. We had more participants than ever. It was really great to be able to um, for people who wouldn't have been able to come to Ann Arbor. They were still able to fully participate in our uh, in our virtual offering. So that was exciting. Um, uh, we do just I don't think this is an official I don't think we've made a, an official public announcement, but in case you're wondering, we are planning to have um, uh, an in person uh, program for the ICPSR summer program next summer, but we will also have um, virtual options so people who can't come to the come to Ann Arbor will still be welcome to participate, but we are also trying to um, re to to resurrect to recreate. Um, the the feeling that we had, the community that we had of people of learners coming together um, in Ann Arbor. So we will try to do both of those this summer. Um, so those are those are ways that the the pandemic has directly affected um, uh, ICPSR and our users. As I mentioned, we've also done things like create. Um, a repository because people have been collecting new kinds of data as you know and you know really some very interesting and creative data sets about attitudes toward covid and attitudes toward vaccines and attitudes toward masking and and behavior in all of these respects um uh data on the policies that have been implemented which have been had um, enormous variety across um, the country and the world. So we wanted to make sure that those data were preserved and we created um, an open ICPSR repository um, for that data to make sure that it was preserved. We're also about to launch um, a coordinating center um, to support health-related research in the social and behavioral sciences um, 
um, that's related to COVID that with the support of the National Institutes of Health. So that's a new sort of expanded um, role for us in supporting um, social science research in COVID um, and trying again to make sure that um, that the data that are being collected are comparable, that people are sharing data concepts for exactly the kinds of um, comparability and interoperability that Ron was talking about earlier. Um, sort of educating people a little bit in um, metadata standards, common data elements, things like that, that really um, increase the, the, the harmonization and comparability of data. So those are all things, those are some activities that we've been doing to support um, researchers in responding to this um, pandemic. Yeah, if I may respond, uh, same here on, on, on working from home, um, training, conferences, uh, it, it, the, the, the ISIS conference in, in, in Sweden had to be postponed. And next year, that's also a, well, that's an official announcement. We, we will have the ISIS in Gothenburg, it will be a hybrid one. So we, we still plan that people can come and, uh, and, and visit the conference. I think it's so, so important to, to have uh, live conferences also in, in terms of efficiency. Uh, if, if I go to a big European or international conference, that, that saves me three weeks of traveling because all the people come to one spot and uh, sometimes I, uh, I, I have to skip the, the 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 presentations because you you have this many meetings and this is all gone. Um, the same for us with uh, European projects. We we have a big project with two hundred people from from all European countries, and you suddenly you have to do this in Zoom, uh, and some issues don't work in in Zoom if you want to have good discussions on new topics um, then then it it becomes extremely um, difficult but the results were secondary effect and then that uh, that that's not in, in CESDA, but uh, we could see it by the in, in european social survey and shares so data collectors first they, they they had the opportunity to include the COVID module in their questionnaire so they they were very agile and they they could provide this information European wide. We also saw our daily, so a secondary effect. Of course, the face to face interviewing collapsed, uh, but the telephone interviewing increased because, because people during the lockdowns, they were happy to, to have someone on the phone and they, they just kept on talking and uh, they're, they're willing to give the answers, etc. So that, that, that was uh, another effect. But, I think it, it, it speeded up uh, some, some innovation on, on how to do the interviewing. And a, another effect is that the cooperation with the life sciences in Europe, we have Elixir uh, with the, with the uh, EMBL Institute in Germany, but the Elixir as a European infrastructure for life sciences. We, we, we start cooperating because as you said, Maggie, in the beginning, um, COVID, yes, it, it was a, a biological or a gene or a vaccine oriented, but now it's, it's behavioral sciences. And you, you have to connect these data. And we are now setting up uh, projects uh, with the life sciences, but also with environment sciences to get the geospatial data. So it influences the way we collect the data and it influences the way we prepare and combine data. Yeah, can I say one other thing about that? So that, th thank you. That actually it was it's interesting. I think we saw very similar kinds of um, changes in the ways that in, in surveys here in the United States as well. I know um, the sort of you couldn't have in person um, data collection, but people were answering their phones because they were home, and it was it was it was it was kind of remarkable. Um, we've also seen some really innovative new data collection um, online during the um, during the the pandemic. Um, oh, I was going to say something. Oh, now I've lost. Anyway, um, maybe it will come back to you. I'll come. It'll come back to me. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, great. It was about have, the uh, pandemic. Yeah, it will definitely come back. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> we have two more questions in the Q and A, so uh, I will start with the first one which was how do archives react to the increasing trend 
driven by health, for instance, to put all data in secure settings by default. So, Ron, would well, you like to go first? Yes, to, to, to encourage this discussion, I like the trend. Um, because I think downloading gives more and more issues. Uh, data are getting bigger, com more complex. If I look at the European Social Survey, you're collecting 10 waves. Um, it is so 400,000 respondents. Uh, when I was still at university, I had to work with the Dutch uh, income panel, but also the, the PSID, the, the American income panel. And I still remember when I, <laughs> I had the uh, stupid idea of printing the documentation and I, I ended up with uh, all these files. Um, but it's... It, and, and then you've done, done the analysis and you find out there is an update in the data. Uh, so, but this was the time of the CD-ROMs and the, well, not floppy, the, the, we, we had even the CD-ROMs, but I think uh, especially on updating data, it's also secure settings. Uh, some data have the sensitivity uh, that makes it difficult, especially in Europe with, with, with privacy issues to put these data just for free and for downloading. Um, it is also, um, and now I forgot something, <laughs> on, on these uh, secure settings. Um, my example is NIH Commons, where they, they, they set up the, the most useful life or health data sets in, in, a, in a safe environment. And this could grow into a platform where researchers meet, meet each other. So it, it, it can be beneficial. Oh, and my point that I forgot is what we see, and that, that, that's not with the university researchers, but with others, data producers want to retain control of what's happening with the data. They want to know who is using them, why. Uh, so this, this, it is getting more uh, restrictive because some producers want to have more control. Um, so, yeah, I'm in favor of, of, of this way of uh, the old client server and logging in and, yeah. I stop here. Thank you, Thank you Ron. How about uh, you, Maggie? Did you have anything to add? Yeah, so I, so I would say a couple things. One is, um, I, I, so I, I appreciate the, the comment by John that we want, we want data to be accessible. Um, and if there are, if there are extra barriers, if there are hurdles to getting access to it, there are lots of users, particularly um, those who are more junior, who are less expertise, who have fewer resources, who might not get access at all. And so we want to try to think about ways to make data as accessible as possible. At the same time, um, there is, as Ron says, there are very real um, increasing risks to um, re-identifying to privacy and confidentiality, um, to re-identifying individuals or organizations that are in data. In data, um, that's partly because, um, as the as the question in, um, indicated, because we include increasingly are having health data integrated with social science data, but it's also because there's so much data out there in the world about people. So if you if you let people download data onto their own computer and they can combine it with other things that are out there, it makes it much, much easier to re-identify people. And we know that this really changes how we have to manage data. And one, one possibility is to anonymize everything to the extent that it, it makes it's, it's virtually impossible to do that, but that degrades the quality of the data. So that's one solution that works for certain use cases. Um, it might, um, there, are, there are options like synthetic data or differentially private data that work well for certain use cases. I think actually, particularly with synthetic data for training, um, you can make those publicly available. They're safe and they're good for people to learn about how to work with data, but they might not be as useful for lots of the kinds of analyses that we care about. For example, if you care about um, 
about ge geospatial questions, which are increasingly important if you're thinking about the pandemic or climate change or anything like that. If you care about the built environment, you need to know where people are, and that makes it much easier to re-identify them. So you need a difference, but you see, and you can't make that information go away or the, the data aren't useful for answering those questions. So what are the solutions? Well, what we the way that we think about this is to take a tiered approach. There's some data that's very safe that we make very easily accessible. There's other data that is less safe that we make that we put restrictions around. And we try and then there's some data that's really really unsafe and we put even more restrictions around that. Sometimes we um, I think it's important to realize that with those tiers, you have both technological and legal and social solutions. Um, we have we have restricted data contracts, which we always have people sign if they're using data that is um, that is sensitive and um, and risky. Um, in some cases, those um, restricted data people then use that data. They can, in fact, download it to a safe computer that that they that they have, so they would still have it locally. Increasingly, we are asking people to work in what we would call a virtual enclave, so a secure space where that we control, where people can sit in their home or sit at their office and log into a secure secure computing environment where we can control things like what other data that they are co connecting it to, so that they can't take a public use data set that they could would allow them to re-identify people because we control the computing environment. Um, there are, um, as Ron suggested, enormous advantages to, um, to those kind of virtual data enclaves because they also facilitate collaboration. Researchers who are in different places can work together. Um, you can even create um, and, um, uh, communities around research, around um, data sets as the, the, in the United States, the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers are um, have bring together in physical locations around the country people who are using um, data that's housed in Washington and they and they connect to it virtually but they actually get to meet and work with other people who are using similar or the same restricted data so you build communities around data um, through virtual and physical enclaves um, so we think that um, we you know we 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 prioritize accessibility but we have to, and, and you do that balanced with um, also uh, with, co with confidentiality and protecting data. And you find solutions that provide access and usability for the particular use case. You want the quality of data, the sensitivity of data, the technology that people are using have to sort of match the research question, the uh, analytical question, and the particular user. Um, so actually another thing which we've done is to develop something which we call a researcher passport, because the truth is the way that you're gonna give access to data to somebody who is, a, is very experienced and has a lifetime of working with confidential data, you might have fewer restrictions on um, technological restrictions on what they're doing than you would somebody who does not have that same kind of experience and reputation. Um, it's also a way of um, making sure that people have the kind of confidentiality training, training in responsible use of data. And we use the researcher passport um, to improve people's understanding of how to work with confidential data um, without creating um, uh, unnecessary barriers. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just remembered already. the other thing that um, when, when Ron was talking about um, surveys during COVID, I think one of the things that COVID has, um, has highlighted is that um, it's important to pay attention to, where, to people's workplace when we, and um, especially, at least in the United States, most of our social science data places people in their households. And that's, that is clearly an important context. But when we're thinking about things like um, disease spread, it was clear that um, disease was spreading at work and some people could work remotely and some people couldn't. There were some workplaces that were much denser. There were workplaces that had more accommodation, different kinds of things. So I think that one of the, one of the important um, steps that we'll be taking in the future is um, placing people in their work environments. And we've been doing this some with the health and retirement study and I'm really excited about that work. Um, allowing us to analyze people, not just where they reside, but where they work, 
um, so that we can look at things like the impact of um, of working in an essential job that was that had to be in person versus um, pe jobs that people could work at um, from home. Actually, we also see this um, uh, when it comes to climate change, right? Um, where people spend their time. That some of the biggest losses that we just had um, this past week in the United States um, because of tornadoes were um, were people who were. Um, at employers where they weren't making individual decisions about how to respond to the incoming tornado. And so those understanding those employment relations and employment locations is really important to understanding um, the, the impact of all of these challenges that we face today. Got to think about. I agree, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't know if, if you allow me to, to also reply to the second question by, mm -hmm. by John Johnson um, on the potential to, that it gives less access. Um, I, I want to highlight uh, or take out, uh, not highlight, take out one, uh, one point on, on this. And that there is a kind of paradox in Europe because uh, research infrastructures are paid by the, by the governments. Uh, and um, that means that you have to provide information about the users and the amount of users. And in a way that, that um, contradicts our policy of having a, a free open access to, to the data. Because now we, we have to get and keep track of who, who is using our data. And that has, in a way, it has nothing to do with security or, or privacy issues, but we need to collect more information about who, who is using or how many are using, because that, that, that's an indicator that, that research funders or, or ministries understand. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of paradox that, uh, yes, they promote the openness of the data, but if, if we don't keep track on, on the amount of users, then we, we have an issue in explaining why we have uh, our infrastructure and our facilities. And let, let me be clear, our main policy remains, data have to be easily and openly accessible for research. That, that, that's sentence number one. Thank you. Well, this has been great so far. We have a... Uh a lot to think about, covered a lot of ground. The next question is gonna be for you, Ron. As someone with over 15 years of experience in senior management and research policy and research infrastructures in international environments in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Norway, what advice would you give to someone starting out in this field? Wow. That's an easy question, but the answer is a little bit more difficult. Um, I, I would almost say follow your heart. I, I, I started up in, in, in labor economics and then it turned out I like doing data management and, and data exploration much more. And then, and, and then I, I ended up in policy and in European policy and uh, five years ago, I, I got a big opportunity to, to, to set up uh, the, the, the SESTA infrastructure, which is uh, working on, on a new institute in, in a way, or combining several distributive uh, research uh, facilities. Um, and I think the big danger is that you start extrapolating, uh, saying, uh, I'm doing this now, so this will be my next track. I, I, my next track. I don't think it's, it's linear, uh, but you grab the opportunities, have your eyes wide open, what's, what's going on around you. And every now and then take a step back and look if you're still doing the, the right things, not if you're doing things right, but if you're doing the right thing. So that, that would be my advice. And, and yes, you must have a, a, a solid uh, base. So I would start with uh, joining a, a big survey or have your feet in the mud and, and, and do the analysis, do, do the questionnaires, do the, do the coding. Um, and then you will see, then you will see what happens. 
Maggie, what what would be your advice? Well, I um, I uh, I I like the way you started out. This people sort of have to follow their heart and um and think about what matters to them. I also think it is absolutely true that um that nobody you know there's there's there are no like five year olds sitting around saying oh I think I want to grow up and work in a data archive right <laughs> um so it, it is it is in some sense it is it's not a direct path I um, mean and um, though I think increasingly there are people who um are are thinking that they want to work with data that and you know that this is sort of thinking about data itself as a as a subject as opposed to a you know I want to be an, an a labor economist or I want to be uh you know a, a study international trade or, or I want to you know study um aging right I mean I think that increasingly we do see people who understand um, the power of big data or the opportunities of big data, or they're at least mesmerized by the opportunities of big data. So they think about data as a, as a direction. Um, so that the, um, so, but I, but in general, I would say that's not the case. And so it is kind of a, you, you know, you, you, you do different things uh, over the course of your life. And I guess some people do, they start off in one thing and they want to just keep doing that forever. Um, but I think, Ron and I must have similar personalities in the sense that you like to take on new challenges. And one of the things that's nice about doing this kind of work, um, leading a, a social science data archive, is that you're 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 integrated. You're working both with researchers who analyze data and with um, the people who work in the archive and who the, um, who are creating the data and who are sharing the data. Um, and so there's both. Um, contributing to the research enterprise and, and to and to social advances in social science at the same time that there's kind of the the, the daily human interaction that um, some some people are happy to avoid but some of us actually really enjoy and um, it's part of what motivates us um, the other thing I would say and this is what I think what Ron was was saying at the end um, that I think is really important and that is um, is is choosing what you do so that it's you're not just it, it's not just sort of following a career path or pleasing somebody else it's thinking about how you have an impact in the world and how you make a difference and people have very different um different personalities and different skills and so there are lots and lots of different answers to that but i think that um i think that we all um feel better and and do better um, at our jobs when um, when when they're mission driven and when we feel like that we're making a contribution and an impact um, with what we're doing rather than just kind of following some sort of predetermined um, checklist of things that you know so uh, that are determined by a school or somebody or a boss or somebody else you know so the sort of how do you um, how do, you, how do you design a career that that you know that you look back and think yeah i've done things that that have been that have been impactful and that i believe in and i care about um and running data archives is just one such way but it, it's a way that i certainly enjoy and makes me feel good about about what i'm doing each day yeah and for, for me one person that inspired me was uh, Randy Pausch. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. And he, he, this this famous last lecture, um, where he started off saying, I, I'm doing things for myself. I want to be at, at Disney to be designer or something. It, that, that was the story. And when he got the chance, he didn't take it because he saw that he he had he was changing and he had changed and his mission became to to help others. And I think that would be wonderful if you go through this phase of me, myself, and I to helping others. And I think in a way, this data data science uh, data archiving is we, we are servicing science, which. I like a lot. So that that that's one of my big inspiration. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing. Uh, another question has come in in the Q and A, so I will I will read it out. 
How are ICPSR and SESDA tracking or even preparing for new legislative initiatives that are pushing companies to open their data for research? And then there was a, three questions. There was another one after that, uh, which was about responding to trends for data localization around the globe. For example, in Asia, do you anticipate that data localization policies might restrict availability of research data for some regions? If you need to re me to repeat a question, let me know. Who would like to uh, who would like to reply? So I'm happy, happy to. Uh, it, there's, there's, there are several different questions in there, so um, but I'm happy to uh, to take a crack at this. So the first thing is, um, I don't think in the United States. Um, there are, I would say that there are, that there's legislation um, that is really pushing companies to open their data for research. There, there is legislation um, that is, uh, that is being considered, particularly with regard to social media companies about responsible use of their data. Um, but I, I don't think this is, we do have, um, uh, we actually have recently um, hired a, a lawyer to be a, our, our, our chief privacy officer here, and again, mostly he's his work is focused on legislation and regulation, and including um, prospective legislation and regulation and how it affects um, um, data. And so, I think that if there were data that was actually encouraging or requiring data sharing by companies, he would he's certainly the person here who would be paying attention to that. On the other hand, we do see companies are choosing to make available their data both um, with the research community in some cases and with statistical agencies in, in, in some cases. And we are um, we are we are actually been, have been working with companies that for whatever reason are trying to um, make their data more accessible to the research community to try to make sure that that's done in a responsible way that they aren't picking and choosing sort of people that you know to analyze their data because they like that particular company we want to make sure that there's that there's ethical access to data um, and but there is an enormous amount of data that private companies have we talk a lot about the social media data but they're also for in terms of economics um, there's there's transaction data about economic transactions about employment about purchases and sales and I mean the supply chain all those kinds of things companies have information about these and if we can make them available um, for research and for statistical purposes, I think that it would, is enormously helpful, would really improve social science and, um, and the data available to us. So we are, we are, um, we are where we have an opportunity, we are trying to facilitate that um, in some sense being um, often sort of like a trusted intermediary to, um, for companies that need that in order to make data available. In terms of the question about localization, I would say two things. One is, I think the, 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 my first reaction is, if we want people in places or communities around the globe to share their data with people in other communities, we have to, we have to treat their data with respect. We have to give people credit. Um, uh, I, there was a, a really interesting discussion recently about um, the Omicron data, which was shared by researchers in um, Southern Africa. And then, you know, that immediately led to repercussions of barriers to, um, for people from Southern Africa to travel. And, and the, but the researchers who had collected that data and who had shared it in an international data archive weren't getting credit. Instead, you know, we were going and talking to researchers from Harvard because that's who we go to in the United States, right? And so I think it's extremely important that um, we give credit to researchers wherever they're from when they do share their data, that we include researchers from um, different from the from the infected communities. Um, in research that's using their data. We also see this within the United States among Native American, Indian, indigenous communities that it's that they, people, they, those communities often feel like researchers from outside come in and collect data and study them and, and, and they have no agency and no control of that process. So I think that the first thing to do is for researchers to be respectful and inclusive um, of, of communities um, uh, who may not have the same kind of access to universities and computing and, and, and the global stage, 
Um, and if we do that, then they will be more willing <laughs> to share their data. Um, that that there is there is a reciprocity, and um, so I think that's the that's the that's the key. Now, obviously. I believe in data sharing. I believe in data access. I don't want someone to say, "Oh, you can only get data if you are, you know, if you are here in in this country." Um, on the other hand, I think saying that, um, particularly for countries in what we might call the global south, countries where there has been a history of colonization or a lack of respect, I think saying that local researchers should be part of research research that uses their data is actually part of how we make sure that. Um, people who are not from those communities learn to um, to respect um, uh, those communities that are being studied, and um, so I uh, we want we want data sharing, we want data access, but I think that we get that by being respectful, by giving credit to um, to indigenous communities, um, by engaging them um, in the research and giving them credit for what they've done, um, both sharing their data and in their research. Thank you. We got a fun question that just came in. If you were the president of the European Commission or the United States of America for one day, what would you do? I want that one. <laughs> so, no, that, I would start a Manhattan Project for the Social Sciences and Humanities um, because in the in the in the pace we are going now, it will take forty to fifty years be before we catch up with, with all the other disciplines. At the same time, you see the Facebooks and 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 all these platforms, the the Twitters, they collect our data. They they know everything. They they even know what we are going to decide. Uh, decide. They know what we are going to vote. I want back control on, on, on that, that at least in, in a public environment, in a scientific environment, we, we have the same kind of facility. So I, I would make a hundred million dollars uh, available for, for uh, a social science uh, Manhattan project. And then the day is over, so yeah. <laughs> I just pose this question to everyone tuning in. What would you do if you were the EC or you as president for a day? See what kind of answers come in. And then Maggie, what would you do? Well, I have to say that the first things that come to my mind are not things that I think about in terms of my um, uh, my role as a leader of a data archive. Um, so they're probably not um, entirely appropriate for this. Um, and, and so I would say, um, I, I love the idea of a Manhattan, um, you know, project, um, sort of a, you know, a, a, you know, really investing in um, global, um, you know, national and global um, data infrastructure. Um, another, another sort of aspect of that, um, I guess, is kind of the follow-on to the Manhattan Project in the United States. After we, after we built the nuclear bomb, we also invested in education in science um, because I think that. We really, we clearly, really need more people who understand data, and who, and 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 sort of having data-driven instruction from the very beginning of you know, you know, young for young children all the way up. I um, I once had heard someone talk about how you know we we train we we prepare at least in the United States we prepare math education is um, sort of preparing people to study calculus, and that made sense when what we were when the primary. Um, uh, sort of goals were things like building bridges and building in, building physical infrastructure where you really need um, uh, you need you need calculus and you know we're, we're if we're building rockets we need you know you need physicists and you need calculus if you're building if what we're doing is building um, in the future a service economy that's driven by data and we use data um, to drive both our physical and our social infrastructure we need broad um, uh, uh, empirical reasoning and data analysis skills, and so investing in um, in that kind of knowledge throughout um, 
throughout the, cur the, the curriculum, I think is really important. And perhaps shifting from a focus on um, preparing everybody to, to do calculus to preparing everyone and to analyze data um, is, is something I think we can do in math education. And I would, and I would really support that. Um, not that I have anything against calculus, but I think you can, I think you can teach people to use data from the time they are in kindergarten. So that's another um, thing. The other thing I would say is, um, is having, and the president of the United States and the head of the EC can't really do this on their own, um, but I think that understanding that the creation of research data um, is actually um, in and of itself valuable. Giving people credit for that is really important. And I think that there are priorities that we can set when we think about how we give out research funding, um, funding for research data and the preservation of data and making data accessible and well-documented. It doesn't sound nearly as exciting as, or isn't um, as writing the new scientific paper, but in fact is incredibly important to um, to the future of social science and to, and to uh, understand the world. So I would say prioritizing um, resources for for high quality data, which is, is kind of like your your man, your Manhattan project, but just a little bit smaller in my phrasing of it. I think Maggie got more time in the day than me, but uh, it's okay. Oh. Yes, you should. Uh, I talk too much. Yeah, it's tricky because no, no. my next, my next question is also for Maggie. Oh, <laughs> you know what? I'll, I will be I will be brief. I, oh, oh no, she's much we'll more keep you to that. The, when she has one day to do to take measures, she she makes twenty four hours. Yeah, full day as uh, president of the U.S. <laughs> so my next question, which I will ask uh, both of you, is what do you think researchers need right now? While Maggie's thinking, Ron? <laughs> um, I think researchers need time and money. <laughs> but um, if, if you look at, at, at both, um, um, data can and data services can be very helpful. J just imagine if you, you had to start your, the data collection by yourself. That would take months or years to collect some of these data. So it, it, that's the time factor. It's also the money factor. And these... these uh, infrastructures are really expensive. If I look at the costs of the European Social Survey in all these countries uh, every two years, that, that, that's huge investment, which, which pays off and gets more, more value as it matures because you have new, new waves. But I think given time and money, we, we can help in, in providing good data services. Uh, it saves the, the researchers time and uh, it's a uh, it, it, yeah, good data collection is more, much more expensive. It's typically something you cannot do on your own. That's why we have research infrastructures. That's why we have even European research infrastructures because some of these activities go above the, the, the reach of, of, of a country in, in Europe or a state in the US. So, so that's why you need to cooperate. Um, and I, I want to, to then to conclude with the, with the, the South African proverb, alone you go faster, but together you go, you go further. Thank you, Ron. That was a nice closing remark. Well, Maggie, if there's no burning answer ah. from your side, I'm sure Dory can go to the next question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I can't wait to get to this one. next question. It means so much to all of us, uh, especially those of us from the Data Brunch podcast. What is your favorite holiday dinner? And those tuning in uh, in the chat, let us know. Did you want us to answer that? Because I might let Ron answer that first. I saw. Yes. saw huh? Yes, uh, everyone can answer it. Anyway, I was gonna say, my favorite holiday dinner. I um, so so I will tell you something. I have basically never eaten meat um in my life. So um, so my idea of of a holiday dinner is probably different from um, from most uh from most people. Um, but I'm trying to think about what kinds of things I'm looking forward to. I uh. <laughs> 
for I've I've been I've been trying to perfect uh, uh, what's called a winter jewel upside down cake um, that um, that Deborah Madison has in her vegetarian cooking for everyone. And it is, uh, it's an upside down cake that has dried fruit and then you sprinkle pomegranates on the top. So it's a beautiful, beautiful Christmas, you know, sort of holiday um, dessert and it's delicious. And, uh, and I'm, I'm working on, I'm trying to make it several times so I get better and better at it because the first time is sometimes not perfect. <laughs> That yeah, I, I I would go if if I may I I would go for the Cesda lunch the Christmas lunch because then every every staff member has to bring some food uh, that they have from the country or that, that that they are good at I hope um so I bring the wine because <laughs> you won't you don't want my food um but uh, th th that that's gorgeous because it, then you have all the flavors and. If if I have to choose one, I I, I forgot the name, Eleanor. It, it, it's what Nina makes with the red herring, the, the herring in a mm -hmm. fur. Oh yes, I did it. It's yes, a Russian uh, it's, um... Russian recipe, and oof, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think uh, it's herring, herring in, in a fur coat. Yeah. Yeah, herring in a fur coat. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. Savory cake. Mm. Yeah. All right. Anyone? Well, else? unfortunately, yeah. Uh, our Christmas lunch had to be cancelled due to COVID. Everyone was very right. disappointed. So we'll have to do it next year. Yeah. <laughs> two days, two days before, before the, the lunch, it was, uh, we had to cancel it. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, we were very, we were very lucky to be able to have our holiday party last week. Um, and I would say about half the people were there in person and a half people were, were, were at their homes and participated um, hybrid. So they didn't, they didn't get any of the food, which was catered. We didn't, we did not have people bring in their own food. Um, uh, but it was, it was fun because we did things like we had our ugly Christmas sweatshirt contest and people had to guess how many um, <laughs> um, candies were in jars and things like that. And that those things you can do over zoom. So we are learning how to, um, how to do fun um things that, that bring people together um, over Zoom. And so that was, so it was nice. It was nice to see the people we could see in person and it was great to be able to include everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and when you come to, to ISIS in Sweden in Gothenburg, they, 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 they will have these uh, famous uh, Swedish uh, recipes where they put the herring and the fish in the ground by now mm. and dig it up uh, in, in June. So then- All right, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> One thing that we, we do have at ICPSR, we use Slack a lot, and there is um, a Slack channel for food lovers. And people before before um, Thanksgiving, people were um, posting their holiday um, menus and their favorite dishes for the holidays. So that's so it's fun. We 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 haven't we don't share them in person, but we've been sharing the recipes online. So that's really fun. And see, someone has chatted Waldorf salad. Tart from Bay that can be vegetarian as well. I even see a recipe has been shared in the chat. Ah, <laughs> is, uh, a link to the herring. Yes, we'll make sure Russian to herring that. under a fur coat. I have to say, I thought that must be a translation issue, but I guess it really is herring in, in a fur coat. Okay, so look for that in our episode notes if you want to try that out. Uh, someone typed their dad's prime rib. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing. Now I'm ready for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm ready so, for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have come to the end. This has been really, really fun. Um, just want to say thank you to the communications teams at ICPSR and SESTA for bringing these two great organizations together. And uh, with that, uh, give everyone a chance to say their last word. Happy holidays for me. Thank you, Dory. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Ron. It's great to see you. Um, and uh, yeah, happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, same here. Thank you, Dory, Eleanor, Maggie, all the others in the, in the back, uh, and um, all the participants. And looking forward to see you at the conference or wherever live. And then we have a beer or a water yeah. or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I loved the ugly, okay. uh, ugly jumper contest idea. 
thinking maybe we should do a, a follow-up podcast next year <laughs> an ugly jumper. <laughs> right. thank you everyone thanks so much thanks Bye. Be safe. okay thank you bye-bye bye-bye